For those of you who've joined us after this, uh, after the morning session, I'm Ken Warren uh, from the uh, Office of the Provost in the Department of English. Um, and I'd like to thank again Jonathan and Francil for getting us um, started with such wonderful presentations. We move on in our program today uh, with a, a talk by um, our, my colleague in the uh, history department, Adam uh, Green, who um, has joined us a short while ago and become uh, immediately a central player in the uh, history department, but also in the study of uh, uh, race here at the University of uh, Chicago. Adam is a um, uh, Yale Ph. Uh, uh, D. Um, and is author of, of uh, a book uh, published by the University of Chicago Press, Selling the Race, Culture and Community in, the, in Black Chicago, 1940-1955. He's also a co-editor of a, a book with uh, Charles Payne, who's also in the uh, on, on the faculty at the SSA and the uh, Department of History. Um, of a book called Time Longer Than Rope, Studies in African American Activism, 1850 to 1950. And he really is one of the uh, premier uh, scholars of the uh, modern civil rights uh, movement. And um, please join me in welcoming Adam Green. OK, um, thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I want to make a couple of uh, statements of thanks. I mean, first to Ken and Kathy for their leadership in terms of putting together the events for today. And I think also really encouraging people around the campus to understand this uh, exhibit as a landmark and a really important occasion to come together and exchange ideas that uh, are both about appreciating the legacy of African American thought, African American academic and intellectual endeavor, but in a certain sense what it means more generally to what we call the life of the mind. I also want to thank Dan Meyer and the staff here in Special Collections for their work in terms of drawing together this program, like so many others that are very important in terms of having a fuller appreciation of the legacy and the richness of the uh, history of the University of Chicago and those that come through it. And I also want to say specifically um, in, in thanks and also in kind of grateful acknowledgement, uh, Danielle Allen's work in terms of putting together this exhibit together with researchers that worked with her and also Dan and other members of the staff here. Uh, this really in a lot of ways is a very, very significant intervention in terms of how we think about African Americans in higher education and that it's available in this form that can be accessed not only by scholars but people coming through the university, uh, in some cases students that may not have a kind of immersion in relation to the material, but a recognition in relation to the documents, the images, the sort of tactile sense of the history that's there. It's very, very powerful. Uh, it's a reminder to us of Danielle's unparalleled talents as an educator and a thinker, and also a reminder to us about how much we miss her in terms of being away. Crescat Ciencia Vita Excolator. I'm beginning with the motto of the University of Chicago, which translates according to the university's own website, let knowledge grow from more to more and so let human life be enriched. I do this for two reasons. First, because I think it articulates a philosophy of higher education as a human and therefore ethical project of development, which is really intrinsic to the activist and ameliorative aspirations of the African-American mind in the United States, if not throughout the world, as well as being exemplary of the values of the institution. So in a sense, I want us to think about the ways in which that motto and that creed in relation to this university is not something necessarily that African-Americans sought to enter into, but in many ways already embodied in relation to the ways in which they approached intellectual endeavor, the ways in which they thought about the value of study over long periods of time in relation to their history. I also refer to this motto because I think it underscores the ways in which this exhibit is an important opportunity to think about, potentially rethink, certainly enrich the ways in which we understand this university's relationship to African-American thought. I think this is important to acknowledge on the one hand, this exhibit and what it chronicles in terms of the 
exceptional support that was given to African American students here at the University of Chicago as graduate degree recipients and undergraduates. This is a credit to the University of Chicago and it's important to acknowledge it as such. At the same time, it is also a challenge to the university and to those who see the university in terms of how we think about this university's relationship to its surrounding community and also to a larger project of really encouraging a sense of intellectual equity, of human dignity in relation to the variety of groups including African Americans within this society. I don't need to go into detail, I think, although I'm sure it will be potentially a rich point of conversation and discussion, both after my remarks and later on today, about the more questionable and dubious history of this institution in relation to either encouraging or discouraging African American education, African American community development, a sense of correspondence and neighborliness between this institution as an institution of the first rank within higher education and its surrounding neighbors who after the 1940s were almost exclusively African American. This exhibit is an occasion, I think, to come back and look at that history and try to deepen it and enrich it in terms of this chapter, largely forgotten, although I'm very grateful for the efforts of both John and Jonathan and Francille in terms of recovering some key aspects and some important stories that they continue to work on in terms of the significance of the presence of African Americans here that this is really in a lot of ways an opportunity for many of us to revisit for the first time just what exactly to make of the ways in which the University of Chicago has related to the project, to the agenda, to the concerns of developing, cultivating, and supporting the African American mind. It's a teachable moment in many ways, encouraging a new appreciation of African American thought, intellectual achievement, and also an acknowledgement of the ways in which the university at some early and important stages was very, very instrumental in terms of encouraging some extraordinary projects on the part of the graduates who are chronicled outside in the various exhibit boxes in this area. In order to really have a sense of what this exhibit is providing us an opportunity to think about, it's really important to revisit the conditions of education and higher education, particularly for African Americans at the cusp of the 19th moving into the 20th century within the United States. There are many ways, and there have been a number of important studies and an increasing number of people who have researched the ways in which this period, this cusp point of moving from an immediate set of post-emancipation decades into what might be thought of as a modern American world, were a time of great ferment and aspiration in relation to African American thought, inquiry, and debate and specifically the ways in which key institutions were built during this period to substantiate that sort of work. Let me just go over this in some broad strokes again in order to suggest some context. Major consortiums and societies are being initiated at the turn of the century in order to ground and in a certain sense professionalize African American thought and African American inquiry at the turn of the century. Organizations like the American Negro Academy uh, the Sanhedrin that Kelly Miller attempted to institute in the 1920s. Uh, a variety of different projects that are situated within campuses and universities that I'll talk about briefly a bit later on in the talk. These formal institutional efforts, of course, are taking place during this important period in relation to African American community building, and they're specifically grounded in a sense of intellectual ambition and the value of inquiry, critique, analysis within black life. More broadly, but no less consequentially, among sort of wider sectors of the African American community. There's, a so, there's important associational activity that is encouraging African Americans to think about their congregation as an opportunity to advance learning, to deepen their thinking, to apply various forms of critique. Here, I think, the efforts particularly of African American women's organizations, the club women movement of the turn of the century, and the ways in which literary circles, various kinds of policy debates, attempts to intervene on the ways in which African Americans and African American women in particular were portrayed and depicted within mainstream society should be understood as a critical intellectual project during this period. 
The African-American press is growing in leaps and bounds at the turn of the century. Some 200 African-American newspapers and periodicals are being published by the time that we come to the turn of the century period. In many ways, these different efforts, along with others, Francille brought up the question of the church and the importance of the transfer from higher education into the church. And while I don't talk about the church, this is certainly also an important area of discourse, inquiry, argument, debate in terms of what sense to make of African American life. In many ways, this is something that is close to an equivalent of what people refer to in the early republic as the Lyceum movement, an attempt to try to find a way to ground a sustained program of inquiry, of learning, of mental improvement within sort of broader communal and social life, generally within the United States in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. And the fact that the Lyceum movement in many ways was the most important sort of locus for sustained inquiry in a pre-professional age of learning within the United States reminds us that in many ways what we're looking at among African Americans at the turn of the century is in some ways a pre-professional phase in relation to their intellectual life and one in which these different sorts of efforts become important in terms of being able to sustain substantial projects of learning, research, and thought. All of this might lead one to think about this period as a golden age in relation to African-American thought and African-American education. And in some instances, people try to stress the extraordinary ambition and opportunity to a point that might lead one to have that assessment. The facts, of course, speak in a different direction in relation to what the conditions were around sustaining black education and black learning during this period. By 1900, according to James Anderson, for example, there were approximately 3,800 African Americans who were attending colleges and what were called normal schools, mainly in the South, but in some other areas as well within the United States. Approximately 400 or so African Americans would graduate annually as a result of these efforts. This is totaling all of the schools across the country. 3,800, 400 as compared to 10 million African Americans. So we have a sense here, even though there's great promise in terms of thinking about ideas like the Talented Tenth Thesis, the sense that there was a trickle-down effect in terms of African Americans being able to access education, that the pipeline, of course, in ways that many of you, I think, are very, very familiar with, was incredibly narrow in relation to people being able to enter into institutions, uh, 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 indulge their ambitions, and cultivate a sense of deepening their thought and advancing their projects, whatever those those might be. One way perhaps to think about this more graphically and anecdotally was that in Atlanta in 1924, the city that had the largest concentration of higher education institutions that was prepared to admit and train African Americans, it wasn't until 1924 that there was even a high school that would educate African Americans on a sustained and serious basis within the city. Something that tells us about the difficulties and challenges in terms of African Americans actually being able to move into any stage of education and receive training commensurate with their talent and their ambition. Uh, another item that kind of underscores this problem in terms of thinking about inequalities around education are the degrees of resources that were accessible to the categories of institution. Given that African Americans were largely excluded and barred from institutions or only admitted predominantly white institutions here I mean, or only admitted on a token basis, the recourse that African Americans had for receiving higher education by and large was that of going to the predominantly black or the historically black system system of schools. Jonathan Holloway and Ben Capel point out in their anthology Black Scholars on the Line that as late as 1928, roughly coterminous with the sort of center date of the period that we're looking at in relation to black graduates at the University of Chicago, the sum total of money spent to operate the country's 17 black land grant institutions, $1.379 million was the equivalent of the average annual cost of operation for any white land-grant institution anywhere within the South. So again, a sense of an extraordinary disparity in relation to scale around the resources that were present there. <laughs> 
Much of this is the product, of course, of long-standing legacies of racism within the country. I do want to stress, though, the ways in which there's a particular turn that's happening in terms of thinking about black higher education at the turn of the century that's important to Mark in terms of thinking about the value of this Chicago story that we're encountering through this exhibit. Philanthropic steering increasingly was pushing African-American higher education more and more either towards vocational training in terms of the mass of African-Americans coming out with a workable skill or training strictly in order to move African-Americans to the role of serving as teachers rather than as researchers, as leaders of institutions, as individuals engaged with trying to advance intellectual fields to their highest levels. And here, I think, is an interesting opportunity to return back to the motto that we started with, let knowledge grow from more to more, and understand in a more kind of ethical, philosophical way just what is being constrained for African Americans at the turn of the century in terms of these bars, in terms of these structural limits on allowing African American education and the individual intellectual ambition of various African Americans to truly advance and flower. There's a place and it's important to acknowledge the significance of the individual stories that Jonathan Holloway, that Francille Wilson, uh, that I'm going to speak about much more generally and much more briefly. But I think we want to keep this structural picture in mind in terms of how difficult it was for African Americans to receive a higher education, how little regard and support broadly African Americans were given in terms of thinking about those kinds of ambitions as being legitimate, important, valuable to the society. Indeed, the ways in which many of the foundations of these general projects of inquiry did not take seriously that African Americans had something to contribute. Something that struck me in listening to the, uh, the Q&A in the last session that uh, Francille, I think, was responding to one of the audience members in terms of talking about in a sense, the, the sort of distinction between theoretical pursuits in relation to sociology and a little bit more of a sense of an empirical kind of intent of trying to sort of document and gather material and that there were distinctions to be made and arguments that came up among and between African American researchers in the 1920s and beyond in terms of thinking about what was the best way to approach this. I would also submit that it's important to understand just how difficult it was to assert that African Americans were legitimate as collectors, as presenters, and as advocates about facts in relation to their own lives. So that while empiricism was something that was a limited kind of scope of inquiry, the ability to be able to say just what the facts were about black life during this period and what kinds of theories people might conjecture from looking at those facts. This was an extraordinarily contested terrain in terms of talking about the politics of whether African Americans should or should not be able to exert themselves and advance themselves in relation to intellectual endeavors. In many ways then, what we're faced with in terms of thinking about the question of African Americans engaging in higher education, pursuing research, following various kinds of lines and projects of inquiry, is something that's more foundational in terms of speaking about a sense of self-sovereignty. What does it mean to be able to come up with the material, the conditions, the descriptions, the ideas that give some kind of shape, some kind of content to an understanding of self? These questions of sovereignty, which we often think about in legal, civil, political, cultural terms, are just as important in terms of understanding the place of intellectual life and intellectual endeavor and critical inquiry at any level of society in relation to anybody's sense of advance and application. Because in a certain sense, having control of oneself, as Du Bois reminded us, of course, in Souls of Black Folk, in many ways starts with defining oneself. And without recourse to being able to present those facts, it's extraordinarily difficult to do that. So it's with this background that I want us to be thinking about what this exhibit is trying to tell us, what it is that we can draw from it in conversation, in active observance, in various kinds of questions, in inquiries that draw from our own stores of wisdom and knowledge.
What I'd like to do is suggest a way to categorize how we might look at some of these figures that we see in relation to the exhibit and how we might think about the sort of effect and the impact of the efforts that these individuals engaged in through their work. I should say that in some ways it might merit a kind of revision slightly of the title that I gave for this talk. In many ways, in a way that I think, I hope is a helpful counterpoint in terms of the presentations of both Jonathan and Francile, this is actually going to be less, in a sense, of a categorization of these students in Chicago and more a categorization of the ways in which these students came to the nodal point of Chicago and then moved out to do things in a variety of other places that were foundational to the ways in which we think about the correspondence of African American thought, American, and human life in the 20th century. I want to suggest four categories in terms of looking at these figures. First, placemakers. Individuals that are able to create institutions, build various kinds of substantive domains, or in some cases inherit those domains and take them to a different level, particularly that's important in terms of supporting the project of higher education and intellectual endeavor. Second, field builders. Individuals who, through their sustained work in relation to research, are able to, in some cases, advance and in other cases, initiate whole new fields of inquiry. By the time that I'm through speaking about this uh, particular domain, I think it will become clear that the legacy of many of these graduates here who came through Chicago and engaged in different sorts of projects is nothing less in many ways than the inauguration of what we think of as a 20th century black studies project in terms of asserting a variety of different paradigms, a variety of different concentrations that proved foundational to the sense that African American intellectual life wasn't something that could be understood in sovereign terms, was something that could be understood as having its own autonomous logic, its own kind of sense of mission and trajectory. Third, archivists, individuals again going back to this distinction between empiricists and theorists, who devote themselves to the work of trying to compile, inventory, draw together, and in a certain sense, protect and secure the resources for allowing for a more empirically grounded research into African American life and studies. And then finally, in a way that's something of a tangent or a coda, but I think is important too in terms of acknowledging these figures, discoverers. Individuals who both initiated those fields, but did so oftentimes under conditions of extreme isolation, often kind of could be understood as being well ahead of their time in terms of the ways in which they were engaging in these projects. I'm going to finish with two natural scientists in terms of talking about that fourth category. First, placemakers. Throughout American history and throughout African American history, there's been a need of, for what the feminist writer, woman writer Virginia Woolf called a room of one's own in terms of thinking about grounding and allowing for African American thought to advance during the 20th century. Some place in which the critical uh, intent and ambition of these projects could be taken seriously. Somewhere where managerial and institutional resources could be devoted to trying to provide the support in relation to sustaining these sorts of projects. An endeavor that was extremely difficult, particularly during the early part of the 20th century, given conditions of funding, given the ways in which the work of African American social scientists, humanists, physical and biological scientists was not necessarily seen as serious work of the first order from sort of national and custodial uh, philanthropic associations and institutions. One of the things that strikes one about looking at the different individuals that are chronicled in this exhibit is the large number that actually go on to lead colleges and universities. Richard R. Wright Jr., for example, before he goes to the AME Church, is going to head Wilberforce College for a number of years. Charles Spurgeon Johnson, who receives his PhD in 1917 and goes on to extensive but ultimately unfinished graduate work in the sociology department, is going to eventually take over Fisk University, I believe in 1948, and be quite instrumental in terms of pushing that institution towards a more ambitious, indeed a more modern sense of itself as a kind of center of African American learning. Among the things that's going to emerge at Fisk University, for instance, after 
Johnson's presidency is the institution of one of the first programs in African studies within the country, founded by another gentleman that I'm going to speak about, Lorenzo Dow Turner, in a couple of minutes. Perhaps the best exemplar of this kind of work of building institutions, as it were, from the top is a recipient of a religious doctorate here at Chicago, Benjamin Mays. He received his PhD in religion in 1935. Mays actually first entered the University of Chicago in 1921, so it was 14 years in terms of getting his doctorate, perhaps a recommendation on the part of us faculty members to not necessarily be so impatient in relation to each and every student who seems to be dwaddling or taking time. Mays more so than most of us uh, who have taken time in relation to our degrees, of course, was preoccupied with quite significant work over the course of this period, teaching at Fisk, teaching at Howard, being engaged in a variety of surveys and research projects related to the intersections of religion and African-American public life. He was only in continuous residence here at the University of Chicago between 1932 and 1934. And during that period, got into more than one dust-up with, with university authorities in relation to the ways in which African-American students were treated. One episode in particular, which uh, comes through in his uh, autobiography, Born to Rebel, pertained with the problems of trying to get a sister-in-law who was an amputee to be able to enjoy uh, residence within one of the main university dormitories out of deference to the sentiments or the supposed sentiments of Southern white women students, the uh, director of housing, and ultimately, to some degree, the dean of students at the university at the time, both said that this would not be something that could be accommodated. Mays proceeded to go all the way to writing to Robert Maynard Hutchins to protest these conditions. And this is, in some ways, representative of some of the challenges and the problems in terms of the social life, in terms of the sort of general social condition of the university that African American students faced during this period. Yet and still, Mays was very devoted and very committed to receiving his degree, was very complimentary about the sort of training that he received over here, and afterwards, following the receipt of his degree, went back to teaching at Howard, ultimately to be asked to assume the presidency of Morehouse University in 1940. And I want us to think a little bit in terms of the, 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 the picture that I was painting before about the problems, the difficulties, the constraints on black higher education at the turn of the century. To think about the legacy of Mays, which in turn informs the legacy of African Americans at the University of Chicago, in terms of just what sort of institution builder Benjamin Mays in fact was. As a result, over the course of his 27 or 28 years as president of Morehouse College, Mays was able to grow faculty salaries over sixfold during the time that he was there, meaning that it was more and more possible to recruit more and more excellent professors, to keep them there for longer periods of time. His, uh, his attrition rate in relation to professors leaving Morehouse was seen to be significantly smaller than many other institutions in the historically black college and university system, and indeed compared favorably with many of the institutions that had the highest, or I suppose the lowest numbers, in relation to the predominantly white institutions. He greatly enhanced the physical plant of the school, building new dormitories, new offices, new classroom buildings. He graduated over 4,000 students during that 27 years, one institution as opposed to the 17 institutions that we were speaking about earlier at the turn of the century. And of that 4,000 uh, group of graduates, over 50% would go on to graduate and professional education. And perhaps sort of most intangibly and most provocatively, Mays was seen as the institutor of the idea of what was called the Morehouse Man, an individual who came from that institution and was able to move around to a number of important roles within society in terms of pushing not just a sense of accomplishment and kind of trained excellence, but also an activist ambition to try to encourage change within society. Lerone Bennett, Jr., until recently the executive editor of Ebony, was a Morehouse man proudly self-identified. David Satcher, the Surgeon General of the United States 10 years ago, was also a proud Morehouse man. Unfortunately, Walter Massey, a trustee of the university and a former vice president, and himself a former president of Morehouse College, is not here with us today. He was a Morehouse man, and perhaps most prominently, Martin Luther King Jr., who spoke about his experience at Morehouse as being absolutely foundational, and the example of Mays as being extraordinarily inspiring in terms of his activist ethic and his sense of broader project as an agent of social change. He too was a Morehouse man. <laughs> 
These kinds of stories tell us about the importance of the ways in which these figures are going out and building institutions that allow for a remedy in relation to the deficit in terms of access to higher education and some sort of nourishment for the ambitions that African Americans had intellectually, certainly before the turn of the century, but especially from that point on in terms of thinking about how to usher in new opportunities, how to create new institutions, how to extend new horizons in relation to black life during this period. Field builders. A different sort of placemaking, I would argue, is involved in generating new fields of inquiry in relation to the efforts of these different graduates that are chronicled within the exhibit here today. Here we're thinking more about those degree recipients who do not go on to institutional managerial work, who professionalize from the top, as it were, the project of African-American intellectual ambition and African-American higher education, but those that remain active researchers. In most cases, in fact, I would say in all but one case that I'm going to speak about in a moment, they remain, in fact, professional researchers, individuals who stay within the academy, engage in different kinds of projects, and inaugurate or extend fields that become foundational later on to the ways in which we think about African American intellectual life. In one case, uh, the person does not, and I think is able to accomplish some very profoundly important things as a result of not being on that track. Let me just run through a few of these people, some a little bit more detailed than others. Many of them will be familiar to you. But again, consider the ways in which all of these individuals comprise part of the legacy of the University of Chicago in terms of their touching through here and the ways in which that gets us to think in a different sort of fashion about the intellectual and, and academic motto and creed of this university. Carter Woodson, of course, receives a bachelor's degree in 1902, a master's in 1907. We know him for the founding of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915, in the basement of the Wabash YMCA, his editing of the Journal of Negro History, and his publication in 1933 of The Miseducation of the Negro, which might be read precisely as a kind of indictment of the sort of education that generally African Americans came into contact with at mainstream institutions. In many ways, Woodson is important both for the inauguration of a sense of an autonomous project of African American history. Other figures, of course, had done this before. George Washington Williams, Du Bois, obviously, is a very important figure in relation to history. But the ways in which Woodson is pushing and encouraging some kind of greater institutionalization of the field, and mechanisms in some ways to disseminate the various kinds of lessons that come from the work that figures who are inspired by African American history and engaged in African American history are able to present means that there's a different kind of ambition that I think we need to think about in relation to Wilson. Of course, one of the outgrowths of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History is the institution first of Negro History Week and eventually Black History Month, arguably the most important mechanism to have been generated during the 20th century in terms of broadcasting understanding of the importance and the significance of African American history, and inspiring a sense of ownership on the part of ordinary African Americans that that history is something that they can speak to. Julian Lewis, who was aged in 1915 and the recipient of a medical doctorate in 1917, a biologist and a practicing doctor who in 1942 would publish a book titled The Biology of the Negro. In many ways, this book was an important kind of place set in terms of establishing the legitimacy of thinking about the medical questions and the epidemiological concerns of African Americans from the standpoint of African American research. Even today, the sort of disparities that come in terms of the devotion of healthcare resources, the attention that are given to different sorts of forms of disease, the cultural versus the environmental explanations that are given in relation to people's senses are fairly unequal in terms of thinking about lines of race within this country. Lewis, although there are elements within this book that reiterate certain kinds of essentialist portrayals and presentations, and in some cases even disparaging presentations and understandings of African American life and African American sort of medical constitution and fitness, nonetheless is a landmark effort in terms of trying to encourage a sense of consulting material specifically drawn from and by African Americans in relation to their lives in order to understand different kinds of approaches, different kinds of concerns in relation to medical policy. 
Oliver Cox, Oliver Cromwell Cox, who received a master's in 1931, a PhD in 1938, is a figure who in many ways, for all of the ways in which we're moving towards a kind of greater empiricist and indeed a more class-oriented social science in terms of looking at African American life, Cox, by some people's lights, was the most strict devotee to that sort of revision in relation to thinking about social science scholarship. And someone who was an especially venerated student while here at the University of Chicago, of course, E. Franklin Fraser should be understood in relation to this effort as well. Um, given that, I think uh, uh, Jonathan spoke at some length about him and also Frank Seal too. I'll leave Fraser out and certainly have other opportunities to speak about him. And obviously a landmark person coming out of the University of Chicago. I mean Southern, who received a bachelor's in 1940 and a master's in 1941 to go on eventually to PhD studies at NYU in musicology later in the 1940s. Taught for years in the uh, City University of New York system and increasingly during the late 1960s became concerned with trying to draw together a curriculum on African American music history. Apparently the first such sustained curriculum within a major university program to be taught. Eventually, in 1973, she would compile her work in relation to teaching this class in the book, The Music of African Ameri Black Americans, A History, which for many people was the kind of first empirical, sustained, extensive and comprehensive study of thinking about African American musical history and the importance of that as a cultural form. Uber Alice. Um, the ways in which Turner's work in turn was an important intervention in relation to thinking about how to rethink African Americans' relations to various kinds of patterns of West African culture, how to think about the correspondence among and between different groups of black folk in the New World as well as the old, in short, how to propose the existence of what we think of today as the African diaspora. It's not coincidental, therefore, that Lorenzo Dow Turner is both the founder of the African Studies program at Fisk and later upon coming to Chicago and taking a position at Roosevelt University, the founder of an African Studies program at Roosevelt University. Finally, the last figure, the one who is not necessarily sort of working within the academy. Catherine Dunham received a Ph.B. in 1936 and a Ph.D. sometime in the 1940s. Unfortunately, I've not been able to ascertain the date. This is something that I've got to work on, and perhaps someone else who's interested in kind of pursuing this might do so as well here in relation to the records. Dunham, of course, is best known for the ways in which she's suggesting the correspondence in terms of an ethnographic method and inquiry and a study of what might be thought of as kind of black kinesis, movement, various kinds of forms of kinetic culture as being constitutive in their own ways of sophisticated communications, important memories, significant knowledge projects. And Dunham in a lot of ways continues that process of thinking about the method of anthropology that he, she had studied at the University of Chicago under Robert Redfield and applying it in relation to her sense about how to produce and generate knowledge within the world of dance that she found around her in the Caribbean and in the New World by being devoted not to a university position in research, but rather to managing a dance school in East St. Louis, which she kept up for decades in terms of trying to encourage young people, particularly in an underserved community as East St. Louis, to think about dance and a serious approach to dance as a way of understanding better natures of the African-American world. <laughs> 
So when we think about these different figures, Fraser on the one hand and Cox in relation to social science, Turner in relation to linguistics, certainly Dunham, and also St. Clair Drake, who I did not mention, in relation to a kind of more anthropological or ethnographic approach to African American culture. We're seeing in many ways nothing short of the initial lines or the kind of genealogical lines of what's eventually going to be the modern black studies project. And the idea that African Americans studied in relation to their own lives, studied in relation to the ideas that are generated from consulting the material that comes out of research in their lives, can offer the platform for rigorous, meaningful, significant intellectual inquiry that can yield great lessons, both in terms of the nature and the direction of African Americans, and more generally, the horizons of human experience and nature. This, I think, is very indicative of the ways in which the work, the aggregate work of these individuals, is leading towards a deeper sense of sovereignty, a deeper sense of self-definition. Archivists. I'll be very brief in relation to this section, too brief in terms of the significance of the efforts of the individuals that are involved here. But again, going back to this problem of who it is that's able to produce, define, and validate a fact about black life at the turn of the century. The importance of individuals who not only produce that work through their scholarship, but curate and secure that work in terms of their archival efforts are very important to understand in terms of the significance of the individuals that are cataloged here within this exhibit. Monroe work has been mentioned already, I know. Very important in terms of the ways in which counter in some ways the reputation of Tuskegee as an apologist institution, work is engaged in the process of trying to inventory as much as possible facts at that point in time in relation to black life through his heading of the department, <coughs> excuse me, of records and research at Tuskegee Institute and the publication of the Negro yearbooks beginning in the mid-19-teens and continuing on into the 1930s and 40s. L.D. Reddick is also a PhD recipient here at Chicago in 1939 in history, actually, and I believe he may be the only one who's cataloged here who comes from the history department specifically, um, for a PhD, I mean. Uh, takes up immediately after receiving his doctorate the role of head curator at the Schomburg Library in New York City and becomes very instrumental not only in terms of deepening and broadening that institutional uh, uh, endeavor and kind of strengthening it, but also encouraging and advocating for a professionalizing of archival practices among African Americans generally through his various articles within the Journal of Negro History, through the work that he did, through the Association of the Study of Negro Life and History, and through his contacts with other archivists around the country. Arna Bontomps receives a master's here at the University of Chicago in 1943, and eventually is going to move on from already very pronounced archival work as the head of the Illinois Writers Project to heading the Fisk Library System uh, during the 1940s and into the 1950s. And of course, Vivian G. Harsh, many of us here in Chicago are familiar in relation to her efforts, in many ways paralleling Reddick's in terms of trying to build up a sustained system of drawing together materials related to African American life, encouraging discourse and inquiry in terms of those materials through various monthly forums, invitation to writers to use the collections, and encouragement to others to think about the library as an important seat and an important basis for African American intellectual life. Let me finish then with the discoverers. In a sense, all of the figures that I've spoken about are discoverers and pioneers in relation to different fields of knowledge. They're initiating new fields. They're engaging in projects that are going to prove foundational and continue in many cases up to the present day in relation to African American intellectual life. But I wanted to bring two figures in particular because I thought that they in some ways kind of represented both the, the, the promise and then in a certain sense the tragedy of African Americans going through this institution or going through any higher education institution in the first half of the 20th century. Ernest Everett Just, who received a PhD in biology in 1916, he came to the biology department as a result of having been put in touch with the head of that department, Frank Lilly, who was also the leader of research at the Woods Hole Laboratory in Massachusetts, the sort of preeminent still today oceanographic research institution within the country, if not within the world. He apprenticed for a number of years there, and on the basis of his work under Lilly, was invited to come in as a PhD student to the biology department. 
His thesis uh, eventually led to a career that was specialized primarily on researching cell membrane properties. And as a result of this research, he proceeded to publish over 50 papers and one landmark study that came out in 1939, The Biology of the Cell Surface. Because of the accomplishment of his work, Just was offered in 1930 the opportunity to join the faculty of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. At that point, one of the, if not the preeminent, biological research centers in the world. Tragically, the fact that the Nazis were coming up, of course, and transforming German society this period both curtailed Just's career and also severely compromised his health forcing him to flee first to Paris in the late 1930s and eventually to the United States in 1941, where he died uh, quite young. Lauded by his biographer, Kenneth Manning, as the black Apollo of science, for many people, just remains the epitome during this first half century of African-American intellectual accomplishment and aspiration. Which makes the other story that I want to tell all the more poignant. This is of Charles Henry Turner who received his PhD in biology 10 years before Just in 1907. Following his doctoral research on the homing properties of ants, Turner continued after receiving his doctorate to look for outlets in relation to his research ambitions. Just like Just, he published widely. He had published 30 articles by the time that he received his doctorate, not after received his doctorate in 1907. And he was the first African American to actually have a publication entered in the journal Science. Yet, no one would hire him. No one would offer him money in relation to his research. No one would support his intellectual endeavors. Climate being what it was in relation to understanding or recognizing the value of African American research, particularly within the natural sciences. Therefore, Turner worked as a high school teacher while continuing to engage in his experiments in St. Louis in relation to studying insects and communication. Switching from ants to honeybees, he began to emphasize particularly what he saw as an advanced capacity on the part of honeybees to discern color using a complex research involving 32 different stages of experiments in order to investigate how it was that honeybees were able to discern and distinguish between different groups of flower and engage in different forms of pollination activities. He published his findings in two different articles in the Biological Bulletin, one in 1910, one in 1911, hypothesizing that the capacity of honeybees to store memory pictures of color was very instrumental to their being such effective pollinators. We cannot know what for sure what would be the impact and what would be the development of this studies. Were Turner someone who had received the kind of support that scientists who were not African Americans could receive for this sort of work? We do know that bee behavior and sensory capacity would become one of the most important components of insect research during the first half of the 20th century. A decade or so after Turner's work, Carl von Frisch, a scientist located in Austria, would initiate his own research on bee communications that, among other things, engaged in some of the same theorizing in relation to talking about bees' capacity to discern color. In 1973, Frisch would win a Nobel Prize for the value of his work in relation to this research. So the efforts of these figures represent an extraordinary contribution in terms of thinking about the development of diverse programs, paradigms, institutions, and in a sense, epistemologies. They greatly encouraged African Americans to think of their lives as serious subjects of study and to think of their minds as vital instruments of human advance. Theirs is a story that we are fortunate indeed to have access to, thanks to this marvelous exhibit. Their legacy is something, as I said before, that brings profound credit to this university and helps inform, balance perhaps, certainly complicate its less than flattering reputation as an influence not always for the good in relation to the course of racial feeling and relations in Chicago and the United States. Therefore, we should take every opportunity to acknowledge and celebrate this legacy of knowledge growing from more to more for the sake of the enrichment of all humankind. Thank you. I think about 10 minutes or, yeah, yeah. or more, I don't know. Uh, sir, and that's a really rich story you told, and I'm curious, could you tell that story about any other university? No, no, I don't think so. Um, and, but I, 
the re and again, this, this is me ventriloquizing or attempting to ventriloquize Danielle in terms of the, uh, the kind of overview that she offers. I think it's at least 45 African Americans who are receiving doctorates from the University of Chicago during its uh, 50 years, roughly, that we're talking about here. No institution has anywhere near that kind of record. Not only no predominantly white institution, but because of the capacities and the difficulties of developing disciplinary programs, administering PhD uh, uh, processes of research, I don't think, possibly Howard, and maybe Jonathan would be in a position to inform this, but I don't think that any historically black university is putting out this number of doctorate holders and certainly being able to bring out this number of master's students. In part, to piggyback off of some of what I heard in terms of the discussion at the end, Chicago itself is an important site. There are resources that have been already spoken about in relation to the richness of public life here, the significance of the institutions that are present here, the encouragement in terms of the ambition that's present, the money that is moving around this community relative to other ones. But I think at the same time, there's perhaps something of a happy coincidence in relation to this. Chicago as a school that was not as well established Chicago is a school that was trying to build itself up in terms of an intellectual reputation. And particularly, and, and Dan has done a lot of work with this in relation to John Boyer in terms of his studies, Chicago as a school that was trying to emphasize often graduate education over undergraduate education. All of this meant that there was a relatively open field as compared to a number of other universities that might be seen as kind of peer institutions, certainly later on, but even, I think, during this first half of the 20th century. But a lot of this, I think, cannot be seen as part of a grand design. I think Chicago was fortunate to have these people come through in this way, and the achievements that these individuals were able to realize and turn into, in a sense, a platform that was going to allow for the growth of knowledge later on is something that's not so much a kind of reflection on either Chicago's self-conscious virtues or even Chicago's certainly intent, but more the coincidence of Chicago being the place in which these individuals intersected. In some ways, I think this is more a charge for us today to think about how to acknowledge this legacy and make it a certain kind of platform for being more self-conscious about promoting this kind of work. Uh, Kathy and then Jonathan. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Thanks. Just like I know when people, I hate when people do this, but something you didn't talk about, which is uh, the question of continuity. Mm -hmm. And so what happens after this period? It seems that Chicago in many ways is positioned to kind of grow in this area, to be in fact the university uh, mm -hmm. that kind of builds black intellectual knowledge, but also kind of knowledge from black intellects. Mm -hmm. And some would, some would argue that, in fact, we haven't fulfilled that, that possibility. Is it that more schools now or, or during that period begin to open up? Is it that uh, Chicago kind of uh, moves away from this opportunity? Is it uh, a changing in the city? I mean, how do we explain the lack of continuity and growth in, in this trajectory? Well, I'll do something that questioners always hate, which is say all of the above. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this, this requires, I think, uh, very, very serious work and research in terms of thinking about both how to really ground the story that I'm presenting largely anecdotally, and at the same time, take what in many ways is an invisible half century of history in relation to this institution, or one that's only known in terms of this institution's policy in relation to thinking about different neighborhoods. Um, uh, someone like Otis Dudley Duncan, who's an important sociologist of the 1950s, and I believe a degree recipient coming out of here. Uh, the various sociologists, of course, that are emerging during the 1980s and the 1990s in Chicago, you know, ranging from uh, Sudhir Venkatesh, not African-American, but an important figure in terms of thinking about questions of race, to, of course, Mary Patillo, a variety of other figures besides that. Um, there remains a rich legacy, but it's a legacy that is certainly constrained by the very antagonistic atmosphere that emerges in the University of Chicago in relation to the surrounding area. Um, those of us that have been around the university, I mean, I've just come back recently, but I was an undergraduate here in the 1980s, are familiar, for example, with the problem of stops 
in terms of African American students with the university police at the time, the second largest police force within the city of Chicago. And I remember directly hearing black graduate students speak about that as a disincentive to either stay, to concentrate on their work, to think about their projects as being something that they could really focus on because they weren't sure that they were even welcome or uh, validated to be within the institution. I'm sure there were many, many stories like this. And indeed, that might or might not be an occasion either in this forum or at some later point to do research and find out what attitudes were. Uh, the Brown decision is taking place during this time. There's a liberalization in terms of access. Uh, African Americans are literally breaking down the door in relation to Southern universities during this period and eventually being able to move into some of these institutions, though not even as we get into the 80s and the 90s in large numbers at the graduate level. Um, so in a certain sense, there are a number of different changes that are taking place. But I'm speaking to this speculatively. I'm speaking to this anecdotally. This is pointing out that this is an area that I think would be very, very important to spend some time investigating seriously in order to tell a story that moves us into the present day. Jonathan, and then back over here. Um, I'll, I'll be brief because I think you've actually answered a fair amount of what I was going to ask. We've been talk I mean, all of us today have been talking about the undergraduates who came here or the graduate students who came here. And we know that the grad students who were here couldn't teach here. They had, they had to go elsewhere. Um, but there is, and again, you might have already just answered this in a sense, but if you know more evidence from not the 80s or 90s, but like the 1940s and 50s, the door does, I mean, truly begin to crack open, crack open for black faculty to show up here. Mm -hmm. But I've not, I'm going to know a little bit about this, but not a whole bunch in terms of what the numbers are like or how quickly that pace picks up, it even really becomes a pace even from the um, mid like 45 or so through like the mid 70s when you see black faculty finally appearing at, at research universities. So I wonder what you might know um, um, about the role of the black faculty here during this Period. I have to say I don't know a great deal, but Francille was shaking her head, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to defer over to Francille on this. Um, the black faculty that come here, at least the first faculty, and for a long time, whoever else comes here, actually are paid by the Rosenwald Foundation and are part of an init a larger initiative that the Rosenwald Foundation has to try to get black people on, on white campuses. So uh, Allison Davis's salary, uh, Abram Harris's salary, mm -hmm. they're never in the departments that they should be in. Mm -hmm. um, Abram Harris is never in the economics department, mm -hmm. um, even though a lot of people would argue he becomes a lot more conservative, certainly switches from Marxism uh, once he's here. But, um, and, and I think that experience makes, you know, there may be a few other people, but that experience means that the next person that comes that makes a big impact probably is John Hope Franklin. And there are a lot of uh, historians in my generation that come here specifically to work with John Hope Franklin. And I think that's different from the experience, at least before the Great Migration. One of the reasons that black people come here is that you can get into the University of Chicago, again, this is because of its newness, by examination. And the examinations are given in a number of cities. Like Harvard and Columbia only give their examinations in about three cities, and this makes it harder for uh, people from ge different geographical areas to sit mm -hmm. for those examinations. Or you have to be at an accredited college. There are virtually no H what we now call HCBUs that are accredited until after World War II. I mean, they're, they're not even in the accrediting process. So this makes Chicago a lot, e you know, this makes Chicago an entry point for black teachers, for black students, in a way that the other schools aren't. We should remember that Du Bois has to take a second BA at, at Harvard. And so Chicago is, is better, and I don't know as much about the 20s and 30s, 
but it's easier. I mean, Charles S. Jo it depends on your school. Charles S. Johnson does have to take a second BA. I mean, he graduated from Virginia Union. But if you went to Fisk, Atlanta, or Howard, increasingly you could go to the other schools. But for women, and, and this is not just for black people, it's also a case for women, and it's the reason that women have more uh, masters and PhDs, at least in the social sciences, I don't know about the natural mm -hmm. sciences, from Chicago in the early years. It's, it's more accessible. I think just stressing, I want to come over to this side, but just stressing the ways in which both then admission policies and funding are very important in terms of thinking about this history in deeper terms. It's not something that I have a grasp on at all. It would involve a certain kind of research to get to that point, but I, I think that this is something that absolutely is significant in all probability in the story. Yeah, I, I guess in a way I feel I'm part of ancient history. When I came to the University of Chicago as a freshman in 1967, mm -hmm. there were 35 of us in the freshman class, mm -hmm. and that was like unheard of. I mean, it was just mind-blowing because there were probably 35 of us and there weren't 35 other blacks who were in the other classes. There may have been some in the graduate school. But I think at, in 1967, we felt a sense of isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, there was always a conspiracy. You know, People who were in biology mm -hmm. always felt that somebody was changing the location of the classes mm -hmm. so they couldn't get there. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was a very serious, uh, a very serious feeling. But we sort of came together as a way of, of organizing around that sense of isolation. Mm -hmm. Is there any sense that there was a community of any of the other students, or were they too far yeah. sparsed you know, between each other? The, the, way that I, the way that I set the talk up, which was not really thinking in terms of clusters and jumping in some cases from the teens to the 40s back to the 30s, I mean, it, it disrupts, I think, a real engagement with that. And also, I think it would require a more sustained social research of their communities than I gave to it for the, for the purpose of this talk. There is some, I mean, in the sense that you have obviously important exchanges and clusters. I think obviously the one that Jonathan identified in terms of his book, in terms of thinking about not Bunch, of course, coming from another area, but Frazier and then eventually coming into contact with Harris and these sorts of things. There were places one could see this. What I might submit is that the relations, and you could certainly inform and perhaps even correct my, my, my proposal on this, the degree to which African American students at the University of Chicago could pursue relations with black Chicago in a way that was not mediated, that was not fraught, that was not obstructed, that was not uh, uh, confounded in different sorts of ways. Uh, I would say was probably much, much more likely before 1950. Not just because of the way in which the university takes a little bit of a harder sort of stance in terms of policing its boundaries, in large part because the neighborhoods directly adjacent to it are becoming predominantly African American, but because of the economic downturn in terms of these areas and the kinds of questions of negotiating, what are the ways in which you establish solidarities and affinities oftentimes across pretty significant class lines from student to community member is something that was not quite as profound a question. And again, if Francille would correct me that in terms of thinking about the actual experience of these students, uh, you know, it, it would just sort of complicate and enrich the story, I suppose. But my sense is that there was a little bit more opportunity to be able to do this as an individual student. I, I should just say for a moment that when I was here, not with 35 students, but with I think 72 students in my class uh, in 1981, there were similar issues around isolation. And I think there were various sorts of ways that people addressed them. And this is one of the reasons why I think this is an important turn and an important opportunity within the university. Because having a sense of this legacy and understanding the ways in which this legacy in fact exemplifies in the highest sense what the university can be more so than what the university has always been means that there's a different sort of way to understand your place within it. Um, I never took a class with a black professor when I was here. I rarely had a sense that the institution was engaged, interested in, um, 
uh, happy about, in a sense, whatever connections it had in terms of significant African American thinkers and scholars. Um, I've learned a little bit more, but I think that at that time, that history was very, very complicated, as it sounds like it was when you were here. And I think that these sorts of interventions allow us to kind of you know, interrupt the sense that when we're ready, we'll bring you in here and you'll be happy that you've become part of this project. Because in a certain sense, this project, the way in which the University of Chicago has thought about itself as a serious institution in relation to research and intellectual endeavor, has always been something that African Americans have played a significant role in. And it's important to claim that and to rethink the ways in which we understand the university in relation to that. OK, we're going to take one more question before we break. A uh, couple of, well, actually, I'm going to have two. <laughs> yeah. One, um, some time ago, a, um, actually a fashion writer in the Tribune uh, whose parents, and I think grandparents, went to the university, uh, commented upon you know, the issue of black students having to redo their bachelors and therefore having to work while they were in school and the ways in which that interfered with their work. Uh, I would think having to redo the bachelor's would have the advantage also of the students being more mature and of them being able to build on having already done collegiate work. And if one wants to understand what uh, black graduates of the university contributed, I think one would have to look at both those factors and how they interplayed. Mm -hmm. And there's another one that has often interested me. Uh, both my parents graduated from U of C. My mother in 31, my dad in 33. And then my mother stayed for grad school whereas my dad went elsewhere for law school. And I've often tried to figure out what they didn't learn at the university due to whatever social isolation must have occurred. Mm -hmm. Because an awful lot of what one learns in college, what one learns in grad school, one learns from other grad students. Mm -hmm. And so a question I've had, and I don't know that I've really answered it, is to what extent did they learn or not learn the things that went beyond the lecture in the library? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll try to do the first question quickly and by no means offer you know, a kind of exhaustive answer. But as you're, as you're bringing up that scenario of, in a sense, double enrichment prior to coming in and therefore having perhaps a leg up in relation to things, that, that may be true in terms of the material that comes in. But again, I'm thinking about the attitude, the disposition that a student has if they feel isolated and if they feel, to some extent, I guess, probationary in terms of their presence. Uh, you might sort of think about the research of Claude Steele, for instance, in terms of test performance today for African American and other sort of students that are seen to have uh, smaller, smaller kinds of levels or lower levels in relation to test performance, that there's almost a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that comes in with internalizing a sense of either stigma or probation or contingency in terms of one's presence. It might be the case at the same time that someone has a sense, you know, I know this stuff twice as good as the other people that are there, that that sense of stigma counterbalances that, if not sort of takes it down a bit. But that would be something, I think, to investigate you know, more seriously and in a more sustained way. On the second point, um, the isolation question, there's a great anecdote in um, the, the writer Gwendolyn Brooks's prose poem, Maud Martha where she tells the story of an African-American who either is a student at the university or a kind of hanger-on in the Hyde Park University community, a guy named David McKempster. And McKempster, for those of us who sort of work within history, is obsessed with the idea that his white fellow classmates have grown up with Vernon Parrington, an important sort of mid-century US historian, on the bookshelves at their home. So they kick Parrington around like a football, whereas I've got to learn how to kind of catch up in terms of understanding this great defining thinker in relation to US history all on my own. And Brooks presented this character almost as being kind of hermetic, 
in terms of his incapacity to get beyond Hyde Park, his inability to sort of see what was going on out there that might train him and engage him in a different sort of way of understanding both human experience generally and black experience in particular. The answer I guess I would give is that so many of the figures, it seems to me, that come in, get these degrees, and immediately go out and start engaging in a project, often they're older students, often they're already engaged in important and significant work, often their studies take a long time because of the projects that they're devoted to either in Chicago or elsewhere. Benjamin Mays was literally shuttling back and forth from different areas in the South in order to be able to finish up his doctorate in religion. And maybe that is important in terms of the ways in which these figures are, on the one hand, able to take much of what's the best out of a, an education from the University of Chicago, and at the same time understand that education as a gateway rather than a terminal station in terms of their sort of mental and intellectual lives. They continue to sort of think about how to acquire more and more and learn more and more. Some of that, I think, is that they're already in the practice of understanding that the university is but one place among many where they learn and grow more intelligent. And I suppose within that is a lesson to all of us in terms of how we think about our lives on campuses. Thank you for the questions.